It all started as something that seemed like an innocent joke. It was a fall day, a Tuesday like any other. We lived in a house in the suburbs, nothing special. I worked from home and my girlfriend Jessica used to go to the office. We had a normal life. Movies on the weekends, cheap dinners on weekdays to watch the budget, and the occasional walk in the park to clear our heads. The neighborhood was quiet, perfect for a young couple like us. The first ring of the doorbell was on a Thursday night. We were having dinner. We heard it, both of us. I got up, went to the door, and when I opened it, no one was there. It must be a brat playing. When I returned to the table, Jessica looked at me curiously. I told her that no one was there. It was just a mistake or some joke. But after that first ring, it happened more often. It was always the same. The doorbell rang, but when I went out, no one was there. Sometimes I didn't even bother to open the door. Jessica would have teased me saying I was getting paranoid. It was weird, yes, but not enough to worry about. Not yet. The trouble started when it wasn't just the doorbell. A few days later, things in the yard started appearing out of place. The water hose was always coiled in a corner, but one morning I found it lying in the middle of the yard. Then it was a broken flower pot, and the next day, a chair from the porch that we never moved appeared on the sidewalk. It seemed as if someone was playing with us, moving things just enough to make us doubt whether it had been us or not. The teasing became more frequent. The doorbell rang almost every night, and worst of all, it wasn't just outside anymore. One day, Jessica noticed that one of her favorite plants appeared on the living room floor as if someone had knocked it over. We looked at each other, not knowing what to say. They were just jokes. If someone went to the trouble of breaking into our house, I doubt they would leave without stealing anything, and that was what puzzled me. Sometimes we would hear soft noises, light footsteps rustling. We couldn't be sure if it was the house or something else. Every time this happened, I would come downstairs armed, a knife in hand. The idea of someone, even if they were teenagers, coming into the house seemed to terrify me, and what scared me the most was that they seemed to be getting more and more animated. We decided it would be best to talk to the police. We called on a Sunday morning. They were friendly, but didn't do much. The officer who came by only suggested we install security cameras. We don't have the budget for that. He just shrugged his shoulders. Well, then just keep your eyes open and call us as soon as you suspect someone is in your house. Stop acting crazy with that knife. It's better to lock yourself in and wait for us. Jessica was very nervous. I was too, although I tried not to show it so she would be calm. But how was I supposed to do that? We were both exhausted from not being able to rest in peace, always thinking about the doorbell, about things showing up in the wrong place. The discomfort was growing, but we didn't know what to do. It was as if they were watching us, but we could never catch them in the act. The discomfort was beginning to consume us. And then Halloween came a day we normally enjoyed. But it was going to be the worst day of our lives. That day, we had bought candy for the neighborhood kids and planned a quiet night watching horror movies. We had started to watch one of our favorite movies when suddenly the power went out. Jessa looked at me, visibly frightened. I got up to see what was going on. Hey, relax, it must be the generator. I went down to the basement, flashlight in hand, and when I got there, I realized I was right. There was no power coming in. After shining the light on it to look for the source of the problem, I was terrified. This was deliberate. Someone had intentionally messed up the generator. I hurried up the stairs, worried about Jessica. When I reached the living room, I saw her sitting on the couch, eyes closed. She was awake, but she looked asleep as if sedated. A huge man, over six feet tall, was behind her, holding her by the neck. He had a long knife in his hand. I was breathing heavily. I couldn't believe what was happening. The generator was calculated for this to happen. I tried to approach, but he signaled me with the knife, telling me not to. At that moment, the doorbell rang. The man said nothing but pointed to the door. I understood that he wanted me to go and open it. I walked slowly, my mind blank, thinking only of Jessica. As I looked through the hole in the door, I saw seven or eight. There were eight people all in black robes. The one in front was a woman, and upon seeing me, she greeted me. Hello. 
Can we come in? I shouted to let Jessica go, but the woman simply repeated the same question. Can we come in? I shouted again, but she didn't flinch. She just looked at me, waiting for an answer. Why are you asking my permission if one of you is already inside? Because that's the rule. You have to invite us. My mind clouded over. I didn't know what to do. I looked into the room and saw the man with the knife still holding Jessica. I couldn't let them hurt her. It's okay. You can come in, but please, don't do anything to us. One by one, the hooded men crossed the threshold, walking slowly into the house. The last to enter was the woman who had spoken to me. As she passed me, I felt a prick in my arm. She had pulled a syringe out of her clothes and stuck me with it before I could react. I felt the world shake around me. My head was spinning and I struggled to stand. I tried to move, but my legs refused to cooperate. The dizziness completely seized me and the last thing I saw before I hit the ground was Jessica's increasingly blurry figure. When I woke up, everything was different. There was no furniture in the dining room. Instead, the floor was covered with red candles arranged in a perfect circle. I was in the center, barely able to move. On the other side, I saw Jessica. She was suspended in midair, her body held up by that tall man who pointed the knife at her just before. One of the hooded men with a long knife began to cut her skin, first the arms, then the legs. My girlfriend's blood was dripping into a bucket held by another one of them. I was too dizzy to understand what was happening, but I couldn't stop watching. It all seemed unreal, and I even thought it was a dream. Jessica's blood was poured over me. I felt its warmth mixed with the cold that was already invading my body. My eyelids became heavy and the dizziness intensified. I tried to fight it, but I could not. Everything went dark. The liquid was making me come to my senses and I was understanding what was happening. Someone was filling my body with my girlfriend's blood. I tried to scream, but I could only babble a little. Just enough for my mouth to open and I could feel the metallic taste on my lips. And suddenly, another blackout. When I came to, I was back in the living room. The furniture had returned to its place as if nothing had happened. The movie we had been watching before the blackout was back on the screen as if the power had never been cut. But not everything was the same. I looked at my hands. They were covered in dried blood. My clothes were soaked. Then I saw her, Jessica sitting on the couch, but her body was mutilated. Her arms and legs were still open, just as the man in the robe had left. She was dead, dead and disfigured, her body soaking the couch and the floor. I never recovered. Although the police declared me innocent and the case was filed as the work of a cult, I had changed everything. I still live in that house, and if you wonder how I can do it, I wouldn't know how to answer you either. Since that day, I have felt bad. It's as if I only function in automatic mode. I can't make any decisions. I don't think it's part of that ritual. I just think I saw more than I could handle. To make matters worse, I keep hearing the doorbell ring in the evenings, but when I go to open it, there's no one there. Honestly, I don't care anymore. I consider the worst thing that could happen to me to be over. If I never see those people again, great. And if they come back to kill me, maybe they're doing me a favor. I don't remember much of my childhood, honestly. It wasn't the best at all. I guess a lot of it is repressed. I was only 10 years old when it all happened, and if there is one thing I remember, it was that day. It all started when my dad, Ronald, came home with the candy. We were poor. My brother and I knew we couldn't wait long for Halloween, but when my dad arrived with a bag full of expensive candy, we were happy, although very suspicious. He had been treating us so badly lately, and suddenly he brought us candy? Was it regret? Happy Halloween, kids. I was happy about the candy, but I still didn't want to eat it, so I didn't accept it. Not because I didn't want to, but because I was mad at my dad, and I was going to eat it when he didn't see me. I didn't want to give him the pleasure of eating it in front of him. My brother grabbed it right away. He loved anything sweet. The house was almost in ruins. The walls were crumbling and the roof leaked every time it rained. But that night, my dad was so cheerful that it seemed out of place. I tried not to think about it. 
I thought maybe he was trying to make us forget the misery we were living in. Maybe just a nice gesture on his part. But something in his look, something in the way he insisted that we eat the candy, made my hair stand on end. A few seconds later, my brother had already unwrapped his and was devouring it with a smile on his face. Dad was watching him out of the corner of his eye, which surprised me. I may have been a girl at the time, but I was very perceptive. My dad was acting very, very strange. Eat, please. Don't leave it for later. I had never seen him like this. He was always distant, cold, and barely talked to us. But that night he seemed too interested in me eating that damn candy. Anyway, at the time I didn't suspect anything unusual about him. I just didn't want to eat the candy on a whim. I don't want it now, Dad. Maybe later. At that moment, his face changed. That was the face of my dad I recognized. A violent, abusive face. He was about to say something to me, but suddenly someone knocked on the door. It was Eliza, my best friend. She had been at her grandparents' house and had just returned. She was excited, dressed in a witch costume her grandmother had made. She asked me to come out and play with her, and although she wasn't looking forward to it, her presence was a relief. Dad looked at her and smiled that same smile. He offered her a piece of candy, too. There's candy for you, too, Eliza. Happy Halloween. Eliza, without thinking, took it eagerly. I accepted my candy and we were about to eat them. The fact that my friend accepted it made me want to eat it with her, too. I was opening it, but before I could react, my brother began to riff on the floor. His body was shaking and white foam came out of his mouth. I had no idea what was happening. My brother was having a seizure in the middle of the room, and my dad wasn't doing anything. He just watched. Eliza dropped the candy she was holding and looked at me, frightened. Dad! Dad, do something! His expression changed, but not to concern or fear. It was as if she was calculating something, as if she was waiting for something to happen. My brother was still squirming, and I was paralyzed with fear. Eliza was panicking. She didn't know what to do. I tried to approach my brother, but my dad stopped me. Hey, come closer. What are you waiting for, girls? Eat your damn candy. You! Pick it up and eat it! Do you despise my gift? Eat it now! Eliza grabbed my hand and we ran. Her father's house was right next door and we ran without looking back. I couldn't think. I couldn't process what was happening. I just knew I had to get away from my father and there was no time to waste. We ran desperately to Eliza's house. My father didn't chase us until a few seconds later, but when he did, he was much faster than us. We opened the door and locked ourselves in the house. My friend's father, Mr. Thompson, was in the living room watching TV when we broke into the house. We told him what had happened, but no sooner had we started talking than my dad appeared at the door, banging on it loudly. Open the door! My son has had an accident! Don't listen to him! He killed him! Mr. Thompson ran to the door and tried to block it. My dad was out of control, banging so hard I thought he was going to break it at any moment. The pounding was constant and getting louder and louder. Hey, what's going on? Calm down! I need to get inside. My son has had an accident. Do you mind? I will call the police and let them know what happened, but you need to stay away. My daughter is terrified. She says you threatened her. Eliza and I took refuge in a room, listening to the screams of our parents on the other side of the door. I could hear my dad screaming in despair. Mr. Thompson started being reasonable with him, but my dad was getting angrier and angrier with each passing second. Finally, I heard the door start to break until, after two or three seconds, it gave way. Then I heard the sound of a fight, shouting, banging, furniture falling. Then there was silence. Eliza approached the door, trembling. I didn't want her to open it, but I didn't do anything to stop her either. She turned the doorknob slowly and opened it just enough to see what had happened. What I saw made my blood run cold. My dad was on top of Mr. Thompson, trying to force a piece of candy into his mouth. They were fighting with all their might, but my dad was stronger. Eliza was screaming behind me, and I didn't know what to do. My friend went desperately to hit my dad, but what could she do? She was a ten-year-old girl. My father simply waved her away, and she fell back, crying. 
I looked around, desperate. I saw a candlestick in the corner of the room. I grabbed it, without thinking, and ran to them. With all my strength, I smashed it over my dad's head. My dad fell to the floor, stunned, and Mr. Thompson took advantage of the moment to pin him down. I stood there shaking, unable to move. I had done it. I had stopped my father. A neighbor who had heard the screams called the police. It wasn't long before they arrived, and when they did, the scene they found was more terrifying than they could ever have imagined. My brother was dead. The candy my dad had given him was poisoned with cyanide. The police discovered it later, but at the time, we only knew he was dead and that it was all my father's fault. My dad had been arrested, but the horror for me did not end there. The police questioned my dad and he confessed to everything. He had poisoned the candy to kill my brother and me to collect the life insurance. When he saw that things didn't go as he had hoped, he tried to kill us all to cover up what he had done. But the scariest part was discovering that he had handed out those same candies to other children in the neighborhood. He planned that if he poisoned all the kids on the block, no one would suspect he was to blame. Luckily, everyone followed the Halloween custom, and no one else had eaten the candy. They were going to save it for the end of the night along with the rest of the candy they got. The last thing I remember about my dad is the image of his face. He was frustrated, but he didn't see guilt for what he did. Just regret. Regret that his plan went wrong. After that, I went to my paternal aunt's house. She couldn't believe what her brother had done, and from that day on, she took care of me as if I were her son. From time to time, I still see things about my father. I see his pictures and some documentaries of crimes or terrifying events. Since that day, I have said that my aunt is my mother. I would never tell anyone that my father is the famous Candyman. This story is based on the crime of Ronald Clark O'Brien, infamously known as the Candyman. On Halloween night in 1974, O'Brien gave poison candy laced with cyanide to his eight-year-old son, Timothy, her sister, and other neighborhood children. His plan was to kill his children and collect a life insurance payout. Tragically, Timothy consumed the candy and died later that night. Ah, Halloween. When this time of year comes around, I always have get-togethers and parties with my friends where we celebrate this spooky date. I must admit, this is one of my favorite holidays, although it wasn't always that way. When I was a kid, I never wanted to go to any Halloween party, and I didn't go out trick-or-treating with my friends. I used to stay home and watch horror movies. I was very scared, so I don't remember why I watched them so much. I was happy with this lifestyle, until something happened, and I never wanted to spend Halloween at home again. That day I was at home on Halloween night. I was babysitting my younger brother while my parents took my other brother with his friends to a Halloween party. I was already 13 years old, so I could be left alone. Nothing could have prepared me for what was coming next, though. My parents were gone, and my brother had fallen asleep on the couch. I was watching Friday the 13th, the typical Halloween movie. I was kind of bored since I had seen that movie several times and Jason wasn't a really scary villain. I was distracted looking at the ceiling until something caught my eye. Someone was tapping on the window next to me. Who could it be? The window was covered with a curtain so I couldn't see who it was. It could be a child, but I was no fool. I knew that approaching this window at this time of night was a big mistake, especially on Halloween night when a bunch of teenagers were sure to try to scare me. I kept watching the movie, ignoring the sound. But to my surprise, the sound continued. The banging went on and on. And after a few minutes, I had had enough. I decided to put on a horrible mask of terror and went to the window. When I opened the curtain, I was going to be the one to scare the person on the other side. I heard a few seconds more as someone knocked on the window and laughing in anticipation. I suddenly opened it and threw myself towards the closed window with my mask. And that's when I got my first surprise. There was no one on the other side. What? How is this possible? I opened it as soon as I heard the knocking. Suddenly, someone started ringing the doorbell at the main entrance. Normally, I would think that these were just other kids asking for candy. But after what had just happened, 
I was scared. I slowly approached the door, inspecting from afar to make sure the key was in place. Once I was there, I pulled back the window curtain and reached out to see who was behind it. To my surprise, no one was there. When I turned around, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was a person with a pumpkin forehead. Even though I couldn't see his eyes, it was easy to tell that he saw me perfectly since his head was pointing straight at me. As soon as he realized I was looking at him, the hideous man knocked on the window again, calling out to me to open it mockingly. In desperation, I ran to the seat and woke my brother. When he opened his eyes, I looked at the window again and he was gone. My brother was still somewhat small and innocent, so when I told him what had happened, he didn't need any proof that what I told him was real. He was as terrified and scared as I was. My first reaction was to call the police and run away, but I didn't have time because I heard something from the kitchen. Oh no, the back door. Mom and Dad told you to lock it. I know, I forgot. Let's go, now. At this, we both started running up the stairs to lock ourselves in my room. Once we got inside, I closed the door and started to lock it with furniture. We were on a locked second floor and the doors were totally blocked. There was no way anyone or anything could get in and hurt us. Had that man broken the generator? I stood there nervous thinking about my next move. The place was really very dark as if the darkness and blackness had devoured all the light in the place for total darkness. At that moment, I was calmer because I knew he was probably doing this to intimidate me since there was no way he could enter the room on his own. My mischievous smile stopped instantly when I saw something walk around the room from one side to the other. This was not my brother, as his body was like this, and he was next to me. It was something bigger, much bigger. For some reason, my eyes could not adjust to the darkness and I still could not see. Nor was it time to remove the furniture that covered the door, because the moment I did that, this strange silhouette would surely do something to me. Suddenly, something grabbed my feet from under the bed and started pulling, trying to pull me under. I tried as hard as I could to stop it, but it was no use. The force was really too much. I could see how the hands that were pulling me were fat, black, and hairy. Like under the bed, there would be a demon pulling me into the depths of hell. Instead, the pumpkin-headed man stared at me. His terrifying dark eyes pointed at me. In a last attempt to get out, I kicked as hard as I could towards the pumpkin, but nothing worked. I could only watch as the thing that wanted me under the bed kept pulling until it got me. Suddenly, a ray of light invaded the whole room. It was my parents. I looked in the direction of the bedroom door and they opened the door despite the obstacles with great ease. Maybe that door was not ready to stop anyone. I told them everything that happened and concerned, they told me that I was alone all night and that what I was seeing attacking me did not really exist. I tried to tell them that my brother saw everything, but they told me that I did not spend the night with my brother. They took him away. I was really alone in the house. Nervous and thinking I was going to go crazy, I sat down and let my parents tell me what they wanted to tell me. On Halloween last year, I suffered a drunken attack from my uncle at a Halloween party. At that time, he was supposed to keep me and my brother, but he kept drinking until he tried to beat up my brother. For interceding, I took the beating. At that moment, I was proud that I did it because if my little brother had been beaten as I had been, he might not be alive. Do you want more details of what happened that night? The man was in disguise at all times. Do you know what? A man with a pumpkin head. When my parents came home, they had a big fight and my uncle ended up in jail. I had to be hospitalized quickly and although my body eventually healed, my head did not. I spent the first few days thinking I saw my uncle ready to attack me. A few moments later, I would remember everything that had happened, only to forget it all a few hours later. With time, I began to feel better. But what neither I nor my parents knew was that being on Halloween would take me back to that night, and it would all start over again. Today, I am an adult. I would be lying to you if I said I'm completely over it. I mean, I still have some nightmares from that horrible night, and I really prefer never to leave my kids alone. I go to every Halloween party I'm invited to, and I take my kids. 
I was never going to be left alone on that day again. My uncle got out of jail soon after, but some offenses made his sentence get bigger and bigger. He never apologized. Want a moral of what happened? Have fun on Halloween. Don't be afraid to do what you like. The real monster does not appear on these dates, but is with you every day. The monster is always a human, and it can be anyone, even a member of your family. Today is October 31st, and I'm getting my little sister Sarah ready to go trick-or-treating. Every year I take her trick-or-treating, and every year before we leave, I think about the Halloween night when I really met a spirit. This is my true Halloween horror story. Back when I was about eight, my mom left me and my dad behind in our small town to pursue her dreams in the big city. She was never a constant in my life anyways. This brought the burden of raising me and supporting our home on my father's shoulders. He had always been a rock in my life, and his mom, my grandma, also helped in raising me. I distinctly remember the first Halloween after my mother had left for good. My dad did not have the day off as he took up any and every shift to pay the piling stack of bills. That Halloween, he dropped me off at my grandma's place to celebrate Halloween. Over the past few years, my grandma often looked after me when my dad was at work and my mom was unavailable. She lived in a neighboring town in a small, humble home in a pretty, friendly neighborhood. Dad knew that I had a few friends there and would probably go trick-or-treating with them. I enjoyed being at my grandma's place as she baked me cakes, fed me good food, helped me with my homework, and showered me with all the love I missed at my own home. When I got there that day, she baked ghost-shaped cookies for me. We enjoyed our afternoon chatting and planning my costume for the evening. I had decided to become a fairy and had already purchased a costume from Walmart. Even if my dad was rarely physically present, he always made sure all my needs were met. He was the best dad ever, and he still is. Once it was around 5 p.m., my grandma started getting me ready. I still remember laughing so much when she slightly messed up my makeup. Around 6, my grandma took me to the local park to meet up with all the other kids who were going trick-or-treating that evening. We did not have an adult with us, as the neighborhood was a safe space, and a majority of the houses belonged to one or the other kids. As we were about to start, a little girl, maybe six or seven years old, joined the group. I still remember thinking to myself how awesome her costume was. While me and the rest of the kids dressed up as action figures, princesses, cartoons, or superheroes, this little girl's costume was actually scary. She was wearing a baby pink nightgown that reached up to her knees and had frills along the edges. Her hair was so messy as if someone had pulled on them real hard. And the best part of her costume was the long knife that was stabbed into her abdomen, had oozed blood into her nightgown, staining in a dark maroon. Her eyes were dead and had no basket with her to collect candy. She was even barefoot. My little self, though, had taken her character a bit too seriously. Anyway, she seemed really cool, and I was the first one to approach her. Hi there, I'm Eva. Your costume is so awesome! Are you coming with us to trick-or-treating? I asked, to which the girl stared at me blankly, as if she had no clue what I meant. Who are you? What's your name? I asked again, to which she replied, Jen. Nice to meet you, Jen. Now come on, let's go. We have many houses to cover and a lot of candy to collect. I held her pale, cold hand and dragged her along with the group. We went to the first home, and the lady living there gave us all a candy bar. I put mine in my basket like every other kid. Except Jen. Just held hers in her hand and stared at it. Where is your basket, Jen? Where will you keep all your sweets? I don't have one, Eva. Jen replied and looked sad about it. My grandma always said that Halloween is a time to celebrate and not be sad or cry. And I didn't want Jen to feel sad that day. So I offered to hold her sweets in my basket till we finished. Throughout our trick-or-treating, I was beside Jen. You could say we had become good friends in a very short while. I mostly asked questions and Jen answered. Now that I look back upon it, I see the red flags in the situation. 
the fact that Jin never smiled throughout our activity was a bit unsettling, not even when we got a chocolate cake in one of those homes. Her replies were mostly single-worded, and not to mention her chilled, pale skin. My eight-year-old self was just happy to make a new friend. After a lifetime of being neglected by the most important person in my life, it felt like a new beginning. But little did my young self know. When we were all done, all the kids gathered back in the same park. Jen and I separated our candies from our baskets, and I handed over her sweets to her. She struggled to hold them all, but somehow managed to do it in her small palms. Who is coming to pick you up? I asked. No one, said Jen. That was odd, as everyone's parents or guardians were there to pick them up from the park. Even my grandma was coming. Before I could comment on the fact, Mrs. Martin, Anna's mom, approached us. Hey, Eva, I am so sorry, dear, but your grandma is busy preparing dinner, so she won't be here to pick you up. Instead, we'll drop you off on the way to our home. Let's go, my dear. She held my hand and started taking me toward her car. Will you come and play with me tomorrow? I asked Jen as I was walking away with my friend's mom. I don't know. Those were the last words Jen ever said to me before a sad and teary-eyed Jen disappeared from my sight forever as I and Mrs. Martin took a left turn towards her car. As soon as I was home, I couldn't wait to tell my grandma all about the little girl I'd met today and how she wore an awesome costume and how we had quickly become friends. My grandma was glad about it, but when I told her Jen's full name, which I learned later in our conversations while we were trick-or-treating, my grandma's face lost all its color. I didn't know what to make of it when a fun evening suddenly turned into a solemn one, as my grandma was visibly shaken from hearing my story. She warned me to never go close to Jen again and to immediately run to her if I ever saw Jen anywhere. I did not understand why my grandma was so unhappy. Fortunately, I never saw Jen again. I tried asking my grandma what was wrong, but she never told me anything. Days passed, and I forgot all about Jen. A couple of years later, I saw her photo in the local newspaper, and guess what? Jen was wearing the same costume from Halloween. The only difference was, it was never a costume. The article stated that Jen was stabbed to death by her father due to alcohol abuse six years ago, and her dad was being sentenced to life in prison for his crime as his trial was over. So, the Jen I had met that Halloween was not a little girl, but the ghost of a little girl. Every now and then when I take my little stepsister trick-or-treating, I just hope I never see Jen again. What do you think were her motives in showing herself to me? And what would have happened if Mrs. Martin hadn't taken me with her? <laughs>